listening to Coffee and Conversation with Recovery Advocate Network, the nonprofit organization that strives to address the staggering disparity in resource availability for individuals suffering from mental health disorders, processing disorders, addictions, trauma healing, and sexual identity challenges. Together, we strive to end the stigma associated with these challenges so that true healing can begin. Welcome back to Coffee and Conversation with Recovery Advocate Network. I'm your host, Ange, and welcome you to episode number 53. Today's guest is Monica Crawford, the founder and owner of 50 Fierce and Fit. She creates nutrition, fitness, and mindset coaching programs to help female first responders lose fat, gain strength, and take back their confidence so that they can always be fit for duty. Monica began her law enforcement career in 2016 working for a state probation and patrol agency, and then switching to full-time policing. However, her experience within the police department was less than positive. She found it no longer to be a good fit. After enduring three and a half years of chronic stress, Monica resigned and jumped in and created 50 Fierce and Fit. Monica is still active in law enforcement, working patrol part-time for a state agency. To detail her experience in law enforcement and provide the best health and wellness resources possible to female first responders, Monica is in the process of writing her very first book, Surviving Inside the Thin Blue Line, Identifying Abuse, Taking Back Control, and Cultivating Fulfillment in Your Life and Career. The book is set to be published in spring of 2024. You can find Monica on Facebook inside of her group, 50 Fierce and Fit, or on Instagram and TikTok at 50.fierce.and.fit. Okay, enough of this. Let's do it. But first, a reminder about our three C's of engagement. The first one, C, click that subscribe button, turn on your notifications so you don't miss future episodes. The second C, commit. Commit to staying for the full episode. You will hear some amazing stories about her journey, her thoughts on self-care, the importance of sleep, and also some of those keys at the end that you need to remind yourself why you need to keep going every single day and show up. And finally, what's the lassie? Well, of course, it's coffee. So go fill up your coffee, sit back, relax, and let's get started. Okay, listeners. I am super excited to have Monica Crawford here today. We've started off having some technical challenges. So listeners, we're going to start using this software. We may do a combo episode if we have challenges and merge the two. So if you see some funny shenanigans, that would be what it would be. But back to Monica. Now, Monica, I really love when guest take a moment and introduce themselves. I will give an intro and talk some about you, but I really want to hear you introduce yourself to the listeners and share why you're here with us today. Yeah. So my name is Monica Crawford. I own Fibo Fierce and Fit, which is an online nutrition and fitness coaching company um, that works specifically with female first responders. And hearing about you guys and what you do and how you promote mental health and try to share those resources with other people. Um, I'm a huge advocate of that. And I've been through my own struggles within my own law enforcement career where my mental health personally struggled. And so I use a lot of my personal experiences and my own healing process to help other female first responders through those similar struggles too. I love that. And I also know that you're in the middle of writing a book. So I think that, A, you're going to be a guest now. And then when your book is released, we definitely have to have you come back for the book club so that we can talk about the actual book. But we could probably give some teasers about the book now, right? Yeah, um, I've got like two or three chapters left to write. So it's very close. Um, We just started doing some book cover design this week, which is exciting. It like makes it more real, you know. but it's called thriving inside 
the blue line. Um, it's all about taking back your control, identifying abuse and thriving within cultivating fulfillment and also thriving with inside your life and career. Um, I kind of butchered the flow of that title, but that's the gist of it. Um, it's, it follows my story through um, my career in a police department here locally. It's a small snippet of my law enforcement career since I started prior to this agency that I was employed with. But it follows my struggles through the, the three and a half years that I was there. Um, talks a lot about the toxic work environment and chronic stress that I went through and specific situations that I experienced, um, specific individuals I had interactions with. And then towards the end of it, it breaks down nutrition, fitness, and mindset principles and the things that I used to help me get through those situations and also the, the principles that I use within my coaching business and, and what I use to coach my one-on-one -on -one clients that I work with too. Amazing. Amazing. And I, I'm definitely going to share. I can relate. I loved reading about the little snippet of it ahead of time because I have personally experienced a year and a half of living through a similar type environment. And I was just recently talking with my therapist about it. And I was like, you know, now that I'm transitioning into a new job that I'm super excited about, I really can feel the difference in just my mental clarity, the difference in my sleep. I feel like this huge weight has been taken off of me that I didn't even realize I was enduring in that period of time, nor the the 20 pounds that seemed that I gained very easily. And to get that motivation to eat well and exercise while working day in and day out in an environment that was not a healthy situation for me at all was very overwhelming. I'm a former athlete and I, and I just kept saying, why can I not just get my stuff together? And then really, I mean, I love, I cannot read, I can't wait to read the book because I can absolutely relate to how much that weight is just so huge on you and the impact it can have. Yeah, that's funny you mentioned that. I was a, a collegiate gymnast, so I have the athletic background as well. Um, but yeah, it's it's been a struggle. It, it was a struggle for the three and a half years that I was in. And I've almost been out for two years and I'm still within my healing journey of it because chronic stress literally kills you from the inside out. Um, I've been dealing with gut issues, hormone issues, fatigue, brain fog. It, it literally flipped my health upside down without much changing as far as like my lifestyle, like the nutrition, the exercise, the sleep, like all of that stayed the same. But because I couldn't mitigate the stress over the high level of stress for that long of time, it just slowly eroded at my health. So I'm still working with doctors trying to reverse a lot of those effects. And you mentioned the weight gain. I, I, I Same thing with me. I put on 25 pounds in a year and was like, I have no idea how this happens. I don't recognize myself in my body right now. And it's just frustrating. It affects your whole quality of life. Yeah. And I, I guess I also want to be clear in that, you know, I, both of our points, and I, and I just met Monica, but I think she would say the same thing. Both of our points about the weight gain is not saying a, a number in a weight means anything. But what you said at the very end was not recognizing yourself in your body. And, and that's what I was trying to explain recently was I don't really, I don't care what size my jeans are or what size my tops are. I don't care. I just want to feel good inside my body. And I want to you know, look in the mirror and say, yes, that's the person that I, you know, envision in my head and, and kind of thing. And I think that that light and brightness and kind of the sparkle in our eyes and, you know, even in our skin, our skin tone and how we smile or don't smile, the way that stress impacts all of those things, we don't realize. And they also tie into not feeling good within your own body because of these factors, which I think is huge. Yeah, definitely. I think, I, I mean, it's, people may not see it as much on the outside looking in, but it's something that you know is there, especially when you, you look back at pictures and just even like recent events, like looking back at my birthday this last year, I just like go back and look at those photos and I'm like, I know this is me, but it doesn't like reflect like inside me, if that makes sense of like, I can put on a smile and, and have a good time, but I'm still feeling like crap on the inside just because of everything that's still there. 
So what, so I, you started in the police force back in 2016, right? Was that where, was it always a goal that you wanted to be in law enforcement? Was there a motivating factor that brought you into law enforcement? So it's funny because I kind of landed there by, by happenstance. Um, 2013, I graduated with a master's of science in criminal justice. Um, and I actually had the goal of working with the court system. So within criminal justice, you have law enforcement corrections um, and courts. And so I was trying to gear towards more of the court system. And I had an interest in working in probation and parole, like under the court side of things. Um, and I, I went to school at Bowling Green State University. So I was in Northwest Ohio, like the Toledo area. Um, I found a job, I found a couple jobs in the court system and was working up there for a little while, was working as a pre-sentence investigator and report writer within a, a, a probation office where they were supervising offenders. I just wasn't able to do the supervision part, but I was there with them, you know, in like same office. Um, enjoyed that. Um, and then I decided I, I didn't want to stay in, in Ohio. I'm originally from Kansas City, Missouri, um, and it was way too cold way too cold up there too much snow um <laughs> I, agree. I had to go back I south <laughs> i had to go back south um i like warmer weather so what happened was i started applying for state probation positions with missouri arkansas and oklahoma um best opportunity landed me in tulsa area which is where i'm still at um so in 2016 is when i moved here um and i started working with probation and parole but the caveat was here is that their probation and parole officers went through the police academy with everybody else, with like your your police officers um, and all of your law enforcement personnel went through the same academy. So because we had arrest powers, we could arrest people in office, we would go out and do home visits, things like that. So we had to have that same police commission that everybody else had. So that's kind of how I fell into the law enforcement side of things by happenstance. It was just the position that I took was like, hey, you're a commissioned officer, are you okay with that? I'm like, yeah, sure, no big deal. Um, that agency, I enjoyed the hell out of the work that I did, um, but I realized real quick my opportunities were probably going to be limited. Um, and at the time, I was making like thirty grand flat in twenty sixteen. Um, was not enough. Was wow. not enough. Was paycheck to paycheck. No. Um, and that's with a master's degree. So I'm like, this is awesome. Like this is <laughs> this is every like millennials' problem right now is you have all this debt and you can't get a job that even <laughs> pays for the debt, right? Um, yes. So. <laughs> I was, I was dealing with some struggles there, um, kind of like micromanagement, stressful things also. And so I was like, I was really wanting to leave and, and move on. And um, I found a part-time patrol police position at the time and enjoyed working that. And so that's kind of how I transferred into the law enforcement side of things is I transitioned into full-time policing shortly after that, um, which was with um, this last agency that I just got out of. Um, so I was full-time with the the current police or the most recent police department for three and a half years um, and then transitioned back out and went back to work. So I'm still work part-time patrol um, with the state agency here um, and then run my business full-time. So I'm still kind of, I still got the foot in the door, still working, just not as much on the, the law enforcement side of things. So one of the things that I find is the individuals that I know that are often the most successful in building the things like what you're building are the ones who do it because they experienced a life change, positive or negative, because of events. And they just said, look, I, I, other people should not have to go through this. I'm going to advocate for both myself and for these other individuals. And I'm going to create an opportunity that's not currently here. And I'm not going to let my voice be be silenced or, or something like that. And so I, I envision that and I envision your story because you're helping women. So what was that transition for you when you suddenly, I mean, did you just one day have an epiphany and say, okay, this is what I want to do? What did that journey look like? Yeah. So when was it? January of 22 is when I officially opened my business. And Leading up to that, I had been, I made the decision that I needed to get out of the police department. And so I was applying to other positions. I was applying to other law enforcement, um, or not necessarily law enforcement commissions, but I was applying to anything that was still under the criminal justice umbrella, um, whether it was law enforcement or not. I was just trying to transition out. Um, I had two or three pretty solid opportunities. One, 
that I could have, they were going to go through the background process with and pretty much offer me a job. But for me, it was more of like a lateral move kind of just to get out of where I was at. I didn't know if it was really something I wanted to be there long term. And so I wasn't wanting to like job hop and just to get out, just to get out type of thing. So I ended up turning that down, pulled my name out of that process. Um, and then there was actually a teaching job with like a Votech that was going to be like a criminal justice somewhat of like a mini academy for like high school students um, to kind of, if they're on the law enforcement path, it's like the early stages to get them through the law enforcement path. And that was about to be perfect because he's like, you'll be our criminal justice instructor. You'll keep your commission and help with our campus police department and still carry badge and gun on, on campus. That's that and the other be a part of our security team more or less. I was like, fantastic. Like best of both worlds. Um, one of those yeah. things where I got down to, got down to the final two and, wasn't the one they chose. So um, by that time I was pretty gutted and I was like, um, this opportunity to run my business had come across, it was a Facebook ad for a business coach. Um, and at that time it was one of those weird realizations of my, after getting out of, of gymnastics and retiring from the NCAA level, I got into CrossFit and I got into nutrition coaching. And at the time I was like, I've got more experience. I've got more years on with CrossFit than I do in law enforcement now, because I started CrossFit when I was still wrapping up my degree before I even really started my professional career at that point. So I was like, I could very well do this. Like I knew that like my background was probably going to be CrossFit training something if I had to switch gears. So that was kind of the thing of like, well, I could start a nutrition coaching business. I could do programming. Um, I could help law enforcement officers. And so I, my, my, he's now my husband at the time, my fiance was like, you can't lose. Like you might as well bet on yourself and go for it. Cause it's either a side hustle and some extra change or it's a way out. So for, from January through April, I was kind of burning the candles at both ends because I was working four days a week and I was off three days a week. So the three days off, I was like all bore, like trying to get clients, trying to push my business, trying to, to get it off the ground. Um, and then kind of, it was the culmination of events where the things at the police department took a turn for the worse. Um, my stress was at an all time high. My mental health was in the gutter and it was like, I've got every no up until this point. So now it's jump jump, figure it out on the way down. Um, and thank God the universe, I mean, whatever energy level out there you believe, um, it happened all at the right time. I was able to jump. All of a sudden, I got enough clients that hit full-time income, and it all happened within the same month of April, that year that I had resigned from the police department and gone full-time with my business. That is amazing. Now, did the did the business coach help you decide that your target market was going to be people like yourself? I mean, you have a, I, I you know, your, your business is built around helping female police officers stay as fit and healthy as they possibly can so they can be successful at their job. And I assume also successful in all areas of their life. Was that something that you intuitively knew, like, this is the market that I really want to focus on and I'll take other clients, but here is what my mission is. Or is that something that the business coach helped you help walk you through? Yes and no. Um, so within the, and I'm sure it's relevant for other businesses, but especially within the nutrition coaching and fitness coaching business, one of the first lessons that they teach you is you need to find your niche. You need to find the people you want to work with. Because if you're trying to catch everybody, you're going to get nobody. Like your messaging has to be specific to who it is you want to work with. Otherwise, it won't be, nobody will know who you're trying to talk to, essentially. So I still have a big passion for law enforcement and, and first responder fields in general. Um, originally, I was just trying to work with, with female police officers. And actually, I did have a business coach that was like, if you're not getting enough people, why not open it up to all female first responders? I was like, you know what? That's not a bad idea. Um, and I thought it was I cool. That. I, I, that's, that was at the time where, I mean, my branding is like a, a muted flag on most everything. So I have like the red, white, and blue patriotic theme going for first responders and things like that. And so, and that's, that's when the business picked up too, of kind of opened the doors, you know, I would get some inquiries. Well, I'm not a cop. Can you help me? Um, things like that. And so th there was some guidance there to find that niche, but I think it, it's one of those things of like, I want 
female law enforcement and female first responders to have fulfilled careers where they're happy, they're healthy. Um, they're not dealing with all of the negative things, the mental health and the struggles that I was dealing with. And because I believe that you can have a successful career in first responder fields, but it takes an approach to prioritize yourself, to mitigate all of the negative stuff that comes hurling at us all the time from all the places, whether it's negative work environment, the traumas on the street, um, managing your work-life balance. Like there's, there's stress that comes outside of work too, right? Like we're not in a bubble. So really trying to take an aggressive approach to taking back your control with your health, um, finding that work-life balance, and also putting up some boundaries of, I'm not going to let you work my ass into the ground anymore. I'm not doing all these overtime shifts. Um, I'm not putting up with all of this toxic behavior. Like I'm going to leave or I'm going to take the steps to protect myself, or I'm going to figure out what I can control within the position I'm at and make the best of it and deal with it. So. I, I, I think it's possible. I know it's possible to find healthy environments. The, the part-time agency that I work for now, fantastic people, uh, much more positive environment. And with the people I work with, like they exist. They're harder to find, but they exist. Um, and then kind of, I mean, with that too, of I would like to be, to help with the culture change, specifically within law enforcement. And that at a very basic level starts on the individual level of I can, if I can get one more person to show up as the best version of themselves, then you can get two and then three. And then it's kind of like a snowball effect. Because if you get healthy people who show up better at work, then you can start to challenge the negative. You can start, start to take down the people who are making the profession miserable to work in where you have poor leadership or poor policies or poor, you name it. Um, hopefully you can get these healthy people now to work their way into those positions. And then it's just kind of like a waterfall effect. I, I so love this. I, several weeks, maybe about a month ago, was talking with some friends and this whole conversation came up about how people just expect to hate their job. Like people just expect that it is the norm that you hate your Mondays, that you live for the weekend. And this has kind of become a status quo. And I'm, my thought is, whoa, wait, why are we still accepting this at this phase? Because I thousand percent agree with what you just said, Monica. And I've previously built a phenomenal company where people loved their job. The company I, by the time this episode is released at, the company I will be at, I've met all those team members. They are amazing. They love their job. The CEO is amazing. And he cares about each of those individuals as humans. So I, I love what you just said about hey, let's also kind of from the inside in the teams, let's get healthy and let's say this is not acceptable. Like, no, I'm not going to continue to. I mean, recently on LinkedIn, I've seen the images pop up and it's a reminder that the only person who's going to remember you worked late years from now are your kids or your family or your health, right? All of those things. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a balance. I mean, I'm a hard worker. And I can tell from what you said, you're a hard worker. So there's a balance between the energy you put in something. But if the if that something is draining every bit of energy out of you, it's kind of like when I put energy into RAN, for example, I put a lot of energy and a lot of work in it. Everyone with RAN is 100% volunteer. None of us get paid anything. We just do this because we love the mission. And yet, I get payment because I find so much joy out of it. Like it's not draining to me. It's actually adding value to my life and it's giving me energy versus in you know, my previous job that I spent this year and a half with, I put a lot of energy in and yet it, it took that energy and it took more. And, and that's that, that healthy boundary of what you're saying, which I, I love boundaries and it is exactly that. Like, Hey, wait, uh, why are we allowing our jobs to take more of our energy than the job is actually paying for? Right. Yeah. And I, and I mean, I know from a, like a female first responder perspective, um, we go into these career fields knowing um, we're outnumbered. We're less than 10% of the working um, people, first responders, men and women, we're less than 10% of that population we know we're going to have to have a couple more hurdles and challenges to get through to to earn respect, 
so that the guys know we can do the job. We're immediately discounted the minute we step foot in the door of whatever agency we're on because we're women. Um, women are the weaker sex. It's biology. That's fine. You can, you can like acknowledge that fact, but that means we got to be stronger. We got to be better. We got to raise our own standards so that we can become equal or seen as equal as our counterparts. So these women who get into these fields, I think is in speaking from my own experience, we're very driven. We want to make a difference. Like it's like a passion and believing in the work. And then somewhere along the line, it's, it, it gets batted out of you of like, no, this is wrong. We're not going to do this or no. Um, I don't know. We're going to nitpick here. We're going to nitpick here. I'm going to make fun of you here. We're going to just beat you down. And, and I don't think it's just women in general. Let me, let me preface that because it happens to a lot of first responders, men and women alike, but it's like, at some point you have to figure out or remember what your why is when you get into these jobs obviously don't make sure it, whatever it is you're there for is killing your mental and physical health, but remember what your purpose is for being there. And if that purpose is not being, or the passion or calling is not being fulfilled, something needs to change. Um, one of my favorite instructors ever has always said, there's only two people in life that count time backwards and it's cops and convicts because cops are just trying to get to retirement. Why live your life that way? Why work that way? Yeah. Yeah. That that's amazing. So, okay. So tell me this. Okay. So you, you started it and I, I love that you expanded to, to first responders because I also had this thought in my head. I'm a female engineer and I'm a female in the C-suite. So totally relate. I mean, I went to college with all guys and I was like the one girl in the room. I remember actually when I got my first job out of college working for Medtronic and I was being introduced to one of the doctors I was going to work with. And he was just like, why did you hire her? Just because she's cute. And I, I remember the first couple of years, I really worked hard to prove that I was just as smart and just as capable <laughs> as a woman as I would as a man, which is insane. And so I, I can absolutely appreciate that. And, and I also, so I was thinking the numbers within police officers and also within you know, the scope that you can do would not be as great. And opening it up to all first responders, I think, is absolutely brilliant. So then when tell, tell us a little bit about how your theology or how your methodology of this works. Someone someone reaches out to Monica and says, OK, I'm a first responder. We'll, we'll just probably I'm and I'm a first responder and I've always loved healthcare, So I'll just pretend I am, you know, a, a nurse in the ER. OK, and or I'm an EMT. It's going out. That's what I'm going to do. I want to be an EMT. And I, I have these struggles. I read about your program. What are the first steps that I would take to begin working and collaborating with you? Yeah. So usually I, I meet people um, mostly through social media. I have a Facebook group. It's called 50 Fierce and Fit Group. Um, we've got like 1,200 female first responders in there now. Um, so usually I make connections wow. through there. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Um, I make yeah. connections through there and somebody will start a, a conversation, whether it's me or them. Um, I usually try to find out what your goals are, what your needs are and what your main challenges are. So that way I can create a custom program for you. So we'll set up a zoom call, um, where I'll get to know you. I'll get to know more specifics about you. Um, I'm going to find your motivation and your why so that I know what your driving force is so that we get through the program. I can always pull that lever and say, you told me you wanted this. This is your motivating factor here that you're working towards. Um, and then I use, I kind of analyze their goals, their needs, their challenges. And then I craft that into a custom program for them, which what that looks like is we're going to dive into nutrition coaching. I'm going to take a look at what your normal um, intake looks like throughout your week. Um, you're going to log it and send it to me. I'll take a look at it to see what that looks like. And then I'll give you a custom fitness program that's going to meet your needs as far as your fitness and performance goals, your weight loss or strength gain goals, um, also your time demands and your equipment demands. So I can literally craft anything that will fit anybody, whether they've got equipment, whether they've got a whole bunch of time where they don't have any time, um, whether they need three days a week, four or five days a week, or even less. Um, I'll make a custom program that fits them 
where it's going to work on strength and endurance, they're going to see improvements in both as long as they're consistent throughout the program. And then on top of that, we do weekly check-ins. So I'll meet with you at least once a week. Um, everybody has my phone number, so you can text me basically whenever you want. Um, I'm probably not going to respond at midnight, but I'll get it. I'll get it in the morning. Um, <laughs> but I have that constant, that uh, revolving door open for people to communicate with me however they want. Um, but we, we definitely do the check-ins once a week. We'll do a video call once a month as a part of that check-in process. Um, and that's how, where I, I dig into more of like the mindset and the mental health part of it too, where we, we focus on sleep and self-care to make sure that you're taking care of yourself as a foundational tool. Um, and then I'm basically giving you weekly goals, small weekly goals that are obtainable um, that you can build upon the wins as they come. And then it becomes a lifestyle change where these are more lifestyle, like you fast forward six months to the end of the program. These are all lifestyle habits that have changed. Your, your meal quality, um, your meal composition has improved. You now have an idea of what, to, what you need to fuel yourself you know what you need to reach your fitness goals, or at least have a baseline structure of what you need to continue on with um, programming and fitness wise. And then hopefully you, I've also instilled some, some mindset shifts, some perspective shifts, some different ways to look at things. And at the end of the day, you know what you need to maintain your results. You never need another program again, as long as you keep those lifestyle habits consistent, you've learned everything you need to learn. Um, and hopefully it, it's been so it's such a positive experience for you. You're telling other people, you're helping other people through the process, maybe even, um, or you're just, you're trying to snowball into more good things of, of helping more people to take care of themselves, whether you send them my way or you're like helping them as like a, a coworker or friend or, or whatever. That is amazing because absolutely. If you find something that, that works and changes your life. Most people I know want to share that with the people they love and the people that are around them. So how long, and, and maybe the answer is there is no like standard, but on average, how long do clients work with you intensively in this weekly check-in, monthly Zooms, and inputting all of their intake and their exercise and whatnot? What does that type of length of program look like? Typically, it's six months. Um, I've tried the three month programs and after a while I realized that wasn't quite long enough. Um, and for most people, um, just to give some type of guideline, most people come to me wanting to lose anywhere between like 20 to 50 pounds. So if you put a number on that and you're losing one to two pounds a week, 20, 26 weeks and six months, that puts you right in that rep range of, of losing that 25 to 50 pounds. Um, it's also long enough to make sure that you're implementing the lifestyle habits because it takes time to change habits. Um, and also it, it, that amount of time accounts for any challenges or hurdles that come your way. You get sick. Um, you have a bad month at work. I mean, whatever you're dealing with, it kind of gives some cushion in there too. That That's another good thing that I like to teach of like, this is a challenge, but you can work through it. Like, and here's how we're going to do it. Um, because we, again, we don't live in a bubble. So if I can teach you how to do all this stuff in the chaos, when things are great, cakewalk, you're good to go. So it, it kind of gives a good buffer for that. Granted, if somebody has something major and, and they, they kind of fall off for a month because of like a death in the family or something major, I'll usually tack that onto the end of their program of like, hey, this was kind of a disservice to you. I want to make sure you get your full six months. Um, let's add an extra month on just to make sure you, you get what you need because you can't control some of the challenges that come your way sometimes. Um, and then, I mean, priorities adjust too, just depending on what it is. You kind of got to ebb and flow with it. So um, it's meant to be very flexible. It's, it's not hard or rigid. You, you kind of flow with the punches, but it, it's good to get out of like that black and white mindset of on again, off again, or I'm on the diet or I'm off the diet. Um, there's, there's much more gray area that needs to be in the mindset and perspective shifts with it all of like perfection's not required. I just need to keep showing up and I need to keep going. And here's my support and accountability that's going to coach me through it. I love that. I need to just keep showing up and keep going. That's, that is so spot on. That is such a great quote just for life in general, like show up at the best. I, I read something recently that was talking about, you know, giving your hundred percent every day. And it, they were saying basically kind of like, sometimes we think our, we don't realize that today, what Angie's 100% today is may be completely different than what my 100% is tomorrow. I don't need to beat myself down on a particular day when I'm still doing my best. It's just that that particular day 
it's not at the same volume or intensity or metrics that an engineer or someone would put on it, right? But it's showing up as the best self you can show up at, at that day and in that moment and moving forward. Yeah. Um, I have two main mantras that I put on repeat throughout my program and kind of just my content that I put out to people. Um, and it's that small steps add up to big wins and you can't lose if you keep showing up. Because I, I think when most people hear that, you can't lose if you keep showing up. They're like, yeah, you're right. And it, and it kind of gets you out of that, well, poor woe is me. I, I failed today um, versus I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to focus on sleep. I'm going to get my sleep and self-care done today. The nutrition or exercise might not be there, but tomorrow is a new day. And because you mentioned like the checklist. So I, I kind of run a, a people through a checklist too, of, of similar of like, I have a visual that's a pyramid and I call it the pyramid of health. And it starts with sleep, then self-care, then nutrition, then exercise. Um, and I love to put that in a visual because people get it backwards. They, they hone in on the exercise side of things and they work it backwards when you're not ever going to see progress if you don't prioritize your sleep and your self-care because it's your, it's your recovery and your stress mitigation. So I'll, I'll tell people, work through that checklist. Did you get your sleep? You get your seven to nine hours of sleep. Okay, check. Let's move to the next thing. Did you set aside time for self-care today? Okay, great. Let's move to the next thing. Let's go to the nutrition habits and then the exercise habits with the exercise being the, the, like, the last piece um, because that kind of gets you out of, again, like the black and white of like pass fail of like, I'm going to show up and do my best. And today I'm not at my best. So I'm going to go back to the habits that I know that are going to hold the baseline. And then when next, the next day or next week is better, then, then we can keep taking those small steps forward and, and progressing that way too. So I'm obsessed with sleep as well. I love Andrew Huberman's podcast, the Huberman Lab podcast. He does a lot of episodes on sleep. Matt Walker also does a lot of episodes on sleep and the benefit of sleep. I think that a lot of individuals have this idea that they don't need as much sleep as they really need. And so I'm so, I just am thrilled that is the the bottom one. Okay. Or the base, the foundation, I should say. So what are some of your favorite self-care things that you, Monica, use for yourself? The ones I put on repeat um, for myself and for others is uh, journaling. Journaling is probably the big one that I'm a huge advocate of. I think there's a lot of benefit in, in doing a mind dump and putting all of your stuff in your head out on paper. Um, speaking from personal experience, I, I've had so many epiphanies, epiphanies and aha moments going back and rereading those things because you can kind of like, it's like another perspective of like going back and rereading your thoughts type of thing. So I think journaling is great, um, especially before you go to bed. It can help you sleep better because again, you don't have all these thoughts running through your head that you can't turn off when you go to sleep. Um, meditating is great. I love the Calm app. It, it helps with perspective shifts and mindset also, but it helps you just be present in the moment, which a lot of us have a tough time doing because we're, we're always running to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Um, I think that's fantastic. And then getting out and walking, um, getting outside, getting in nature, um, you're still getting some movement in. It's usually pretty relaxing. You're getting all the benefits of being outside and the sunlight and the vitamin D. And and that can help be a stress release as well. Um, and then, I mean, at the end of the day, if you're, if you're struggling with some trauma or anything else that's major, go find a professional, go to a counselor, find somebody else who can give you that third party opinion. That's a neutral opinion. Maybe call you out if they need to challenge you, th all those great things. Um, I'm a huge advocate of, of counseling, but unfortunately, a lot of first responders, sometimes they don't get, I mean, I think they're doing better with providing counselors like through agencies, um, but some of them have a tough time with insurance and trying to find somebody who's covered and, and not going like the cash pay route too. So I think that's getting better, hopefully. Um, but I've always had a counselor that's outside of, because I don't even, this is just my personal opinion, but I don't even like when the counselors are associated with the department. Like, I know they're trying to provide a resource, but I like trying to find somebody who's like away from work, <laughs> not associated to work in yes. any, any way, shape or form. Um, just, I just makes me feel better. Some people love those, those free resources and that's fine. That's great. Use them if that's what you have. Um, but getting, getting to a professional, if you really need it, there's a lot of value in it. I love what you just said, because I also, I'm a huge advocate of 
therapy and counselors. I think anyone who thinks they don't need to find a great therapist, you're lying to yourself. Okay. We all have things in our lives that we would be better human beings if we talked to someone who could help us see things from different perspectives, help us grow through things. And at the same point, the fact is, is that it can be a challenge to find the right therapist. I mean, it's it's very much, I like to use dating analogies, right? Like you're not just going to go online and marry the first person that you do on an app, right? Or that you meet on an app, right? So take the time to visit and, and test out different therapists, you know, figure out some people do better with female therapists, some with male, sometimes age. I don't think it's a discriminatory thing of trying to figure out what in that very sensitive environment, how am I going to show up as my best self and be very vulnerable and being vulnerable is what's so important. And you can't be vulnerable. If you can't be vulnerable with your therapist, then you need to find a new therapist. And because that's the space you should be able to be, you should be able to say anything and feel as if you're accepted as a human being. And if, and, and I know so many people who dread talking to their therapist or have just said, you know, I've had this awful therapist. I'm never going to go back to therapy again because I, you know, had this, well, you know, if you go to a restaurant and eat and you hate the food, you're still probably going to go to another restaurant. You're just going to pick a different one that you can experience what you're looking for. And so I want to just tag that to anyone who struggled with therapists. I mean, when I moved cross country to California, I had an amazing therapist in Georgia. And oftentimes their license is only in certain states. So he wasn't licensed in California. And it took me, I mean, it literally took me nine months of trying multiple therapists. So I found one who was great and amazing. And he's just mm -hmm. been such a blessing to me. And I'm so glad I didn't, you know, win those previous ones that were not blessings to me. <laughs> I'm so glad I didn't say therapy was the problem. Instead, I just said, this is just not a good fit. I'm going to go find something that is a good fit. Yeah, it, it can be tough. I got lucky uh, when I moved here that the first one I found stuck. Um, I've, I've been with her for probably since I moved here. So it's been seven, almost eight years. Um, I've been going to the same, the same counselor. So, uh, but yeah, I, I definitely get that. I, I've tried a couple in the past, like I had one in Ohio and um, even just seeing the differences in, in techniques and kind of what they use because everybody's got their, their different backgrounds and education and kind of methods that they use with their clients too. Um, it was interesting to see the difference uh, in how each one was beneficial. It's just like a different style if you will i guess of of professionals too but i mean you'll find that between coaches and doctors and therapists and all of those professionals too exactly so what advice would you give someone if someone's listening to this episode well first off i guess one question i have is do you work with people who are not first responders i'm wondering if someone's listening to this episode and they're thinking okay I love everything that monica has said i want to find a coach like monica i'm not a first responder what what advice would you give that individual? Or I'm not. Yeah. Right. So yeah, actually, that's a good point. Um, I do work with guys and I have had a couple of male first responders come my way. Um, I think the guys, unless I'm forgetting somebody, the majority of men have been, have been um, police officers for whatever reason. Oh, I had one fire guy. Um, I've had some guys come to me too. And so I can help the guys too. Um, but again, just dialing in your marketing and your language, I, I resonate more with the women. And so I try to hone in on that. That doesn't mean I won't help the men. Um, so that's just like a case by case basis. If they message me and they're like, Hey, I see you're doing this. If, can you help me? If not, can you point me in the right direction to someone who can? So I, I've worked with a handful of them We've, and had good success with the guys too. Um, so I am flexible in that sense. If someone's listening to this and I mean, if you really, I, I would love to, to have a conversation with you if you want to message me. Um, it's a case by case thing. I can definitely see um, see what you're going through again, what your goals, needs, and challenges are. And if it makes sense that I can create something that'll work for you, then absolutely. Um, same same thing you're saying with the counselors. Of, I'm not going to try to help somebody out if I don't feel like it's a good fit or if it's not something that I can help help with. I'll do my best to refer you to somebody who I think will be beneficial for you. But I'm not going to take on somebody and do them a disservice if I don't feel comfortable doing that. So 
I, I can take on whoever I want to basically. And I have the capacity to help whoever I want to. It's just on a case by case basis. Um, I've worked with like, for example, I've worked with like a pharmacist. I've worked with like a nurse. Um, I mean, there's still kind of medical. So there's some overlaps in the shift work and, and stuff like that too. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm here to, I'm always, I'll tell everybody I'm here to help the best I can. Um, I don't care what it is. Um, and just to be a resource for people. So if I can be a positive resource for you and help you reach your goals, then absolutely. Um, let's talk and see if it'll work. Um, it's just those, those few and far between people. If I can help, I can help if it makes a, if it makes sense, then it's a good fit. It's just not like my marketing and language is Amazing. not Okay. So a couple of things. People. One, at the end, we need to make sure we hear what your favorite motivational quote is. And, and it may be the two mantras that you've already listed, or you may have a separate motivational quote. So we'll do that at the very end. But before that, is there anything you really hoped that we would cover today that we haven't talked about or a message you really want to send out to the community that you're super passionate about? If you are struggling, it, it starts with you. It starts with recognizing that you're struggling and that you need to make a change. So me, I joke about it. I'm always your hype girl to prioritize yourself, to take care of you. Um, step up and do what you need to prioritize yourself. Get yourself off of the back burner. Quit making sure everybody else is taken care of before you. Um, I mean, there's caveats to that. Obviously, you got family and kids and all that stuff, but you can still prioritize you. It's not selfish. You need to do what you need to do to show up as the best version of you. You need to fill your own cup so that you can pour over and help other people. Because you as a mom, coworker, sister, whatever role you're in, if you're not taking care of yourself, you're doing a disservice to the other people you're trying to take care of because it starts with you. So first responder or not, if you're in a toxic work environment or you feel like you're literally in the middle of a tornado, everything is just raining down on you, know that you have control in the situation. You can change your situation and you're not stuck. Okay. And your favorite motivational quote? You're never too old to set a new goal or dream a new dream. C.S. Lewis. I love it. Yes, I love it. I love it. Absolutely. It's so true. Well, Monica, this has been amazing. I am, I'm so excited that you, I'm so excited you jumped when you did and you figured it out on your way down, as you mentioned. I think it's, it's amazing. I love that you have over 1,200 people on your Facebook group. I love just the passion in your mission and the difference you're making in the world. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. Yes, I appreciate it. And I just, just to clarify the book title, since I butchered it before, um, be on the lookout. <laughs> okay, it's, yes. <laughs> it's thriving inside the thin blue line, identifying abuse, taking back control and cultivating fulfillment in your life and career. Amazing. And then we'll have you back as a guest after the book comes out. Absolutely. I'd love to. Thank you for joining us today with your coffee and conversation. We hope you've been encouraged and learned something from today's story. To learn more about today's guest, please check out our show notes for more details. Now it's time to remember to like this episode, subscribe, and turn on your notifications to ensure you do not miss future episodes. Recovery Advocate Network envisions a world where individuals with mental health challenges receive comprehensive and effective treatment without the worry of financial burdens to themselves or their families, all without the stigmas often present in society. We are proud that every individual work with RAN does so on a 100% volunteer basis. You can support the mission by making a financial donation via PayPal or Venmo or email donate at recoveryadvocatenetwork.org if you would like to donate items for our next fundraising auction. Please visit our website at www.recoveryadvocatenetwork.org to learn more. Now, stay in the loop about upcoming events, future episodes, and more by following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter X, TikTok, LinkedIn, and all major podcast platforms. As a reminder, the experiences and advice expressed in this episode are the hosts and guests' own personal stories and do not represent the opinions of any organization mentioned. RAN is passionate about opening the doors for all voices and experiences, not just those expressed in any particular podcast. If you want to share your experiences or expertise, we encourage you to be a future guest by emailing us at podcast at recoveryadvocatenetwork.org 
or submit a blog by emailing blog at recoveryadvocatenetwork.org. We also encourage you to comment on the episode so that we can continue to provide content that is most beneficial to the community. How do you do that? Visit our website at www.recoveryadvocatenetwork.org and in the top right corner, click that comment button and comment. So listeners, what do you need to do? Pause what you're doing, subscribe, follow us. Please give us a like and a five-star rating, write some meaningful comments, and most importantly, share these episodes with your friends. You never know whose heart you will touch, so please be a part of a reason someone has new hope today. If this episode was triggering to you, we encourage you to contact your support system, therapist, national and community support groups, the Global Crisis Text Line by texting 741-741 and or, if in the U.S., dialing 988 to reach the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. If you're in the U.S. and need additional resources such as shelter, support group resources, transportation, food, and or a safe, confidential path out of physical or emotional domestic abuse, please call 211 or visit www.211info.org for assistance. Now, we know you are very busy, and we are grateful that you said yes to sharing time with us today. If you stuck to our three C's of engagement and listened to the full episode, then visit the podcast section of our website and leave the comment about the podcast, and you'll be entered to win an autographed copy of one of the books from one of our book club series, as well as a coffee and conversation coffee mug. So thanks again. Until next time, back to your coffee.